Hey everybody and welcome to another episode of Knocked Conscious. Today I have the honor of speaking with Matt Larson. He's the founder of Global Energy Transformation Institute. He works with the transformation to electromobility regarding electric vehicles and all of the infrastructure required to make that happen so we become a 100% electric society. It was a very interesting conversation. He spoke about a lot of interesting topics. It would be interesting to take a listen. I hope you enjoy it and here it is. Welcome to Knocked Conscious. I feel like we just had deja vu because of technical difficulties, but welcome again. Please tell me who you are, what do you do, and uh, how can we help you today? Tell us how you can help out the world. Thank you, Mark. Uh, I'm a business consultant, business consultant since uh, 30 years, and I've spent the past 18 years exploring the re- amounts of resources that would be needed in order to um, change the world's transport systems to uh, electric vehicles. And I've realized how much electricity, how big investments in power grid reinforcement that would be needed, and how extensive the uh, charging infrastructures will need to be in order to um, facilitate the charging on a daily basis of all the vehicles in the future that will need to be uh, charged. If countries decide to to, um, turn to uh, electromobility 100%. So in looking at some of your information, it looks like it's going to require pretty large amounts of energy than what we currently produce. Is that correct? Really large amounts of energy. Absolutely. It's amazing that uh, politicians and business leaders so far haven't realized uh, what type of investments will be needed. Because, for example, in the United States, uh, you will need to double the uh, power generation in order to uh, facilitate the charging of all cars and trucks and buses. And that means that you will need to add another 4,000 terawatt hours of generation on an annual basis to the 4,000 terawatt hours that you already produce in the United States. Uh, And 4,000 terawatt hours just for you to... um, to come to grips with the the, um, figure is equal to the production of 350 nuclear reactors or 1.2 million wind turbines. Wow, 1.2 million wind turbines and wow, 350 nuclear reactors, obviously it'd be thousands of coal or other gas and and other kind as well. Really big amounts of coal, um, of course, Wow. So with all these current changes in in energy in Europe, how how are they addressing a lot of these changes? Are these changes being addressed to the to the level that you're looking at? Well, um, as you know, already um, air regulators in California um, and the EU and the UK government have all decided to ban the sales of fossil fuel cars from 2035 and that means basically that the production of of um, gasoline cars or diesel uh, cars as we also have in Europe will need to cease or be reduced dramatically because it, no, no such cars will be sold in these areas from that uh, year so but unfortunately it doesn't seem as if politicians and and uh, business leaders have realized what this will mean in terms of investments so no one except for myself and a few other people on the, on the planet have started to explore the magnitude of these changes and the the um, um complexity of the change programs that will need to be will be will need to be set in motion so there are enormous 
um, enormous change programs ahead of us in order to achieve this. So there, so 350 nuclear plants. How long does it take for a nuclear plant to be constructed? Well, uh, two days ago, the Swedish government decided to uh, uh, build two new nuclear reactors. They decided they will not build it themselves, of course, uh, but we, they, we will make sure that two new nuclear reactors will be built in Sweden. And they estimate that realistically they can can come online in 2035. So with the planning process, the construction process, and the other processes that, that will be needed, commissioning, for example, um, they will take 12 years. And that is only and, for two reactors. And that's just for two of them. But still, I mean, that's still a long, that's a deck over a decade, right? That's a, it's a pretty big chunk. And we don't even have the planning for it yet. So we have to get to planning, then also getting the implementation of not two of them, but possibly up to 350 of them. Yes, so, absolutely. Fun. That sounds like a fun challenge. Yeah, I, I don't <laughs> so, think the um, the industry, the power plant industry has the resources to build so many in parallel either. So, and there are, there will not be enough resources to um, build and install them in parallel. So they will need to be phased over quite a long period of time. At present, I think you have, uh, well, uh, something like 130 nuclear reactors or something like that in the United States. So it's way right. past what you already have. Right. Well, it's interesting. Uh, it, well, I, I'm curious because there's an alleged uranium issue eventually at fuel, fuel it for the actual nuclear reactors. I know it doesn't use much, but the earth doesn't also have much either, right? So it's also, that's a scale issue. But I'm curious how that translates over time and how that works. I was I was watching uh, an Elon Musk uh, interview with Joe Rogan. He said that for solar power, it would take a hundred square mile, a hundred mile by a hundred miles. So 10,000 square miles of solar panels in the United States for it to power the United States. That doesn't sound like that much, a hundred miles by a hundred miles, but that's a lot of area. Mm -hmm. So that sounds like a lot of because I know that energy is constricted by the amount of uh, energy per square meter by the sun. So it's like a limit. It's not it's limitless in the production of it, but it is limited in its capture of it, I guess, in, in that way. Right. So so there are other ways. Are there any predictions of solar panel? You know, you said one point two million wind turbines. What kind of so is there any solar panel equivalent to that or any kind of? No, I, I haven't imagine. calculated that. I've 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 done these calculations of uh, nuclear reactors and uh, wind turbines because there there are direct numbers, large right? amounts of of both in in the uh, uh, operation, and right. it's so easy to to illustrate because when I started this 18 years ago, I ha I have found it difficult to explain to people what uh, What's a terawatt hour? What's 100 ter terawatt hours? So it one nuclear reactor became a unit of uh, uh, calculation for me, rather than uh, uh, the image of a building. So right. and, well, that, and, it's 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 impactful because a nuclear reactor people can they viscerally get some kind of you know literal yes. reaction from it. But absolutely, and and the the. Um, amount of wind turbines I've got from uh, uh, Germany. Uh, over the past decade or so, they have expanded their wind power generation tremendously. So they now have 30,000 uh, onshore wind turbines and they generate 100 terawatt hours per year, which is a very convenient figure. They have 30,000 generate 100 terawatt hours. So you have, okay. you need 4,000 4, terawatt hours. That's 40 times the German number of, of wind turbines, right. which makes, so it, makes it a good number. Million. The calculations. Yeah. 1,000, 1. 1.2 million. Yes. Yeah. 1.2 million. I think you said it correctly the first time. So that, I mean, that's, that's really interesting. And I don't know if you've heard, but there was an offshore wind turbine company that just, uh, 
collapsed or went bankrupt it said they couldn't afford to do it off the shore of jersey new jersey ah oh, and there have been that. right and there have been some of those offshore challenges with whales i don't know if you've heard about the construction creating some challenges there's some really interesting eco you know and environmental issues that for example offshore wind turbines are causing actually we've had on turn wind turbines issues with birds and things like that makes sense but um i this isn't to you know discourage anything this is just to give it the full picture once again i'm not you know i'm not here to push push anything or another but i'm curious about um so we're we're getting to the point where that is now this is on board electric batteries are there other ways of electrifying that aren't where the battery's on board yes there are but well you need to have some capacity on board but you can well yeah something right you, some way yeah, to transfer but, but to you carry can, to you can charge in various in different ways but there are for example um technologies being developed that for uh, electric roads where cars and trucks can be ch uh, charged uh, as they drive. So dynamic charging uh, can be done via uh, tracks in the road, either um, either uh, conductive tracks or inductive tracks. And there's a Swedish company uh, and a French company offering uh, uh, conductive tracks uh, there's an israeli company offering inductive tracks and then there are german companies offering uh, uh, air overhead cables like overhead. with uh, pantographs in uh, uh, above vehicles so you can uh, you have three different technologies and the uh, um, overhead cables of course are only uh, possible to use for trucks and buses but um, inductive and conductive tracks can be used by either uh, either type of vehicle oh wow that's that sounds really interesting uh are there any stretches of highway is there a mile that there's a test of or where where would that be where would these things be located currently? they've so far been tested in various parts of sweden um there's a test there are three different test uh roads in Sweden, one in the north for um, uh, uh, pantographs, uh, one in uh, uh, around Stockholm for uh, inductive tracks uh, where the Israeli uh, technology is tested and one here in southern Sweden for where the Swedish company Elon Road is located where they t test the uh, uh, conductive tracks. But that's only, they, they've only been tested for half a mile or so yeah, of, of stretch of road and they can charge over like half a mile um a half a mile stretch to go um their entire route uh, in, a, oh, in wow. a, a local transportation network for buses for example and then they go back and they they can charge again along that stretch of of road if they go slowly o over that uh, that stretch and the technologies can actually also be used uh, for stationary charging, so you don't need to have cables, uh, because cables can be a, an occupational hazard for um, people who, um, for drivers, for example, truck drivers, taxi drivers, other other drivers that need to um, uh, connect uh, their charging cables all the time and may trip over cables, uh, and with with tracks in the the surface uh, below the the vehicle you can get rid of cables you you have a much much uh, better uh, work environment and you also reduce the risk that the driver will forget to um, connect the cable and not be able to drive away again when they need the uh, once the the um vehicle has been loaded or re unloaded uh, or when, when the passengers have uh, entered the taxi uh, and you find that, oh, we, we I forgot to, to attach the cable. Uh, I need We need to wait here for, for another 15 minutes for the car to charge. Right, that's pretty impressive. Of those technologies, do you have anyone that you think is uh, preferable over the other two of the other two of those three? Just to, to just the reason I ask that is because it would make sense to standardize. 
because then you could get car companies to build an electric autobahn certified vehicle right and then it works on all autobahn rated whatever you know kind of thing yes i think it makes makes sense to have uh, electric road systems that work for both cars trucks and buses uh, so i think the conductive inductive uh, tracks make the most sense uh, but the uh, Inductive tracks are installed below the road surface, while the conductive tracks one. are installed installed on top of the road surface. Right. So the um, the um, inductive tracks have slightly higher losses of electricity. And since we're talking so big um, amounts of electricity that's going to be used here, a seven percent loss of power because of the um, higher or lower efficiency of the, the charging um, infrastructure means that quite a lot of, of power and quite a number of uh, nuclear reactors or wind turbines need to be added to, to the equation. So I'm partial not only because the company that uh, is Swedish. Uh, <laughs> Swedish, but also because the technology is uh, more uh, energy efficient and uh, has less losses. So um, right. Aesthetically, I, I would think the inductive would be aesthetically pleasing or the most uh, in that respect. So I could see that being more of a political issue of how it looks in a city, right? In a futuristic city. Do we want the gaudiness of a conductive system, right? Or the beauty and the cleanliness with, with that loss? I mean, 7% is a huge loss. So yeah. just from going to conductive to inductive, that's interesting to hear that much of a loss. Yes, uh, absolutely. And it seems both technologies are quite easy to install. You, you, you mill a track in the road uh, and then you uh, install the um, um, the tracks. Uh, so you mill a, a rift, ridge. Uh, or yeah, whatever. it'd probably be a width that'd be something where there would be some con conductivity of yeah, some point along that, it's even a, if it's, it's a, just a strip You mill a hole, in, a hole in the road surface, basically, and then you right. uh, install the, the track uh, the metal track into that and you fill it with uh, uh, asphalt or uh, some other whatever you use for a road uh, for the road surface right and the conduct would and the conductor would actually make more sense because if it say it's parked on the side of a road that is conductive versus having to go wirelessly because there'd be a loss of conduct of electricity over wireless right Con converting from that charging it wirelessly to wired and the safety of plugging it in for your c commercial applications yes uh, uh, excellent abs absolutely that's um there are pros and cons uh, of both technologies i think but uh, the uh, uh, energy efficiency is a, a big uh, uh, a big advantage there is a next step being taken now to install a longer stretch of the conductive track with uh, uh, from Elon Road. Um, the company Elon Road has nothing Excellent. to do with Elon Musk. It's uh, <laughs> because the Swedish word for electricity is el, and el on road is uh, that is amazing. On road. What a coincidence, so, right? What <laughs> yes. a coincidence. But but it, that there. There is going to be a, a, a stretch of a mile or a couple of miles to be installed outside of Paris as the next Excellent. test uh, uh, project for the uh, conductive uh, installation. Okay. So you've written books. I understand. I, I know you have six of them that I know of, but I think you mentioned before that you might have a couple more so share 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 us your your like your first book your evolution your your latest and and i'd love to hear more about that you know the literature you've written out on it so we can share it with people to to look it up yes thank you my latest book is called how building the future really works and it was published in uh, august this year and it's available at a discount uh, right now at um, amazon.com 
So that is really the, um, uh, it's discussing how technologies like space technologies, computer technologies, um, airplane technologies and other um, other well, mobile phone technologies, etc., have been developed in the past, and how we are ne how we need to learn from those experiences and from those projects uh, when we when we plan the projects of the future. And I started this journey with a book called Global Energy Transformation that was published in 2009, and in that book. We, I, I explored the different fuels that could be used and the different systems that, that would have to be developed in order to drive a large share of all vehicles on um, re renewable fuels. So that's, that discusses bio, biofuels, um, yeah. electricity and well, hydrogen and other opportunities. And I found there that electricity is the only possible fuel that can be produced in large enough volumes to drive all cars in any country with. Because biofuels uh, that you make from either um, either um, uh, agriculture. Well, you got ethanol products. and corn and things like that. Yeah, exactly. Uh, well, the we challenge is also you're burning things. Remember, just, just biofuel is still a burn. It's not the conversion like a hydrogen car and it's not electricity. So there is still a conversion of creating you know, emissions. Absolutely. So uh, that's, uh, and there is a limit because we can't use very much of our agricultural land to uh, grow um, crops for energy production. And in order to produce enough biofuels, we'd need four times the entire, wor the world's entire area of, uh, of agricultural land to, to uh, fuel all trucks, uh, all cars and buses in the, in the world. So the amounts of oil that we use are 100 million barrels every day, 33 billion barrels per year. And that's a huge amount of oil that can only be replaced uh, completely by electricity. Uh, so, and doing something else, uh, or starting the development of a bio biofuel um, transport system on a large scale would be foolish because we couldn't uh, couldn't go the, the the entire distance with that because we'd only be able to power to to fuel like a couple of percent of the world's vehicles. Right, that totally makes sense. Excellent. So. Um, you you said you mentioned you wrote a couple novels as well, in addition to the six books. Yes, uh, I wrote uh, two novels in Swedish because a couple say ten years after I had written the f first book, I realized that this was really difficult to grasp for uh, people who didn't have the time to sit down and take in these numbers. There are big numbers. There are they are um, well. It seems that there are, it takes some effort to um, um, sit down, think through it, to realize the size of uh, of vehicle fleets. Like you have yeah, the scope. The scope million. is pretty massive when you think about how many vehicles and and mass in the country yeah. or in the you, world are. You actually have two hundred eighty five million <clears throat> cars in the United States. And to fuel all those with electricity, you'd need um, you need some 6,000 kilowatt hours per year per car. And wow. to do that, uh, that, that 
e equals uh, 1,400 terawatt hours of electricity only for the cars. So that amounts to the, the generation of 125 nuclear reactors. And then you'd need a, a, as once more the same number and, and again some to uh, fuel the- To power trucks, other to, things to, like, to power the trucks like air conditioning. Uh, no, the tr just for the transportation. To, oh, to, just to, for the for, transportation. For, the, oh my for the, the, the trucks and buses and so on. Oh, so you'd wow, need, yeah. You'd need 4,000 terawatt hours in, um, uh, in total to um, par uh, power your entire uh, vehicle fleets. And I suppose also to cover the need to of electricity for battery production. But that's only- And that's fragment. where the 350 comes. So, yes, exactly. So that's 350 on top of current energy production, correct? Correct. This is just for electric mobility. Yes. That's definitely. astonishing. That's a big number. So yeah, it would make sense you'd want to write something in a little bit more of a readable text than just throwing numbers like that at you because they can get very overwhelming. Yes, I, I wrote the, the novels in Swedish uh, because uh, in at the time I tried to convince uh, people over here to uh, regarding the uh, complexity of the efforts and the need of the efforts because I yeah. tried to illustrate also the values that are at risk here because the pre uh, previous generations have actually built a society here that we have to uh, take care of and we need to make sure that we don't damage it in a way that for example, that could cause irreparable damage uh, if we make decisions about the changes uh, or if we fail to make changes where they are needed, we could cause irreparable damage to um, economies, to, um, to uh, job markets, to uh, the yeah. ability of, of people to continue to leave, live their lives in the way they are used to. Well, the well, the petroleum industry is a huge market. I mean, they're like like we talked about. It's a requirement. Plastics, all these other things are made with the petroleum's petroleum pieces. We we need that now. As fuel stations, gas stations disappear, that economy is going to shift somewhere, or it's going to have to. So, that's where the concern comes in: is how that how that's going to happen. So, you know, there's so many economical factors that go in. Have you considered anything economically in general about the economics of it, of, of electrification? Yes. Um, actually, I decided yesterday to uh, uh, that my next book would be called The uh, uh, Economic Consequences of Electromobility. Okay. And I will, in that book, discuss the various economic uh, processes that we set in motion by doing these changes. We set in motion processes that will affect auto, in, uh, auto companies like Ford, General Motors. Uh, they will be deeply affected and impacted by uh, the change to electric cars and they will lose their opportunity if if uh, petrol gasoline cars are banned, they will lose their uh, opportunity to to sell what is not what are now their cash cows, uh, gasoline cars, and they have to instead take on uh, Tesla as a competitor head on and uh, try to make make money producing electric cars, which of course Tesla does with excellence, but uh, for the moment, uh, Ford, for example, have projected uh, uh, a loss of, is it $60,000 per uh, electric car vehicle that's sold uh, in this year. So it's a huge wow. loss and- Volkswagen, I know they shut, I thought they pulled some funding toward, they pulled some money from from some electrification because of the challenges they're having. Yes, absolutely. Mm -hmm. They've uh, drawn down their investments in this area due to the um, um, the changes. Um, 
all of the incumbents have different problems uh, tackling this um, this um, transformation because it, Volkswagen, for example, they say, well, the the CEO of Volkswagen uh, convened a meeting digitally with all his 1,000 uh, top managers uh, two months ago. And he said that the roof is burning, which is a German phrase indicating right. that everything is at stake. And right. he said uh, that uh, they need to um, cut down on spending in all areas, not only because they have invested too much in uh, electric cars, but because they also face a strong competition from uh, uh, other manufacturers and so on. But uh, clearly, uh, auto companies in Europe, as well as in the US, um, find it very difficult to handle the current development. And they make losses from uh, uh, Many seem to make losses from electric cars. Ford is the only uh, auto company that has organized its electric cars in a separate business unit so that they have to report um, the profits and losses of right. that unit specifically. Right. They, they didn't meld it into the rest of the, like GM could melt it into the rest of their profit and loss statement and balance that out. I like that though, because Ford's always been pretty innovative. I mean, Ford, they've always been pretty ahead of the curve. To keep it separate might be the good way to do it because they can then either justify it or figure out ways to streamline it and things like that and keep them both running. Absolutely. But it also makes it possible for external people like us and uh, and journalists to uh, monitor to pick it apart <laughs> to, to monitor their exact uh, it's, it's profits true. or losses from from the uh, electric car business so it's uh, uh, i i believe it's uh, there are both pros and cons to doing that it's a double edged sword especially cuz you can look at a number many different ways i mean yes you can look at a loss but you could also look at it's called an investment there is an investment needed to all new changes to technology. So it's not it's not ultimately a loss if it pushes technology. Absolutely. Forward. That this happens all the time. Uh, when I remember when spending they, three thousand, four thousand dollars for a television and now I can get the same one for five hundred. So yes. you know, three hundred. The difference here is that there is one company that got the business model exactly right for the moment and that's Tesla. Uh, they, they have because they built an electric car company. They didn't build a car company, or they didn't. No, exactly. They didn't convert. They built it f literally for the purpose of, of that. So they, it's specifically designed for it. Yes, and they only have a very narrow range of models, and uh, so they only have, but they they can have the advantages of scale of having few models and big sales of each model. Whereas a company like uh, Volkswagen, it said that they had started to develop um, 20 or 25 different models of electric car to fill the various niches where right. they have cars at present, uh, which they need- Were they not using the same platform though? I mean, that, that would be, it would make sense if that were the case. Obviously a heavier vehicle would require a little bit bigger battery, but if you had a standardized platform and just put a different top on it or whatever, it would, it would make sense if that were the ultimate. But to your point, making five or six different platforms would be even almost challenging. Yeah, I think, I, I don't think they could use the same platform because in order to have a full range of of models, they'd need to have both small models like right. the Polo and bigger models. Well, I'd wonder if you could have like batteries maybe plug in, plugging in between them. Say it's like a skateboard model, and then you have like you could do like a table leaf, right, on a on a on an oak table for a dining room table. Slide it in this way, and you can slide it in vertically or horizontally to make it a wider or longer vehicle. Just thoughts. Anyway, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but it's interesting. I don't know if you saw Joe, uh, Elon Musk on Joe Rogan this recently, but I would ask that you that you check it out because he he spoke to this exact problem you're talking about. He said, man, you there isn't a movie about manufacturers. 
you talk about Tucker and all these designers. He said manufacturing is the single biggest challenge because it can only go as fast as its worst part, right? Million moving parts, one part you can't get, the whole thing shuts down. He said manufacturing, he said his new plant was just has been absolutely challenging. And whoever can make those types of things happen, those are the real geniuses. So Yes. To your point, and, it's a big problem. Tesla have solved a number of very intricate problems with their manufacturing. Uh, and I'm sure they've transferred experiences from SpaceX and other, because the challenges in the, uh, in the auto industry are extreme because they, there are high volumes. <clears throat> you need to produce at very low cost, <clears throat> very long series and you need to reach a highly competitive price of the entire vehicle and i think tesla they they haven't they may not produce the best cars in the world uh if you look at them from a from a uh, design perspective and, and so on but they certainly have nailed the business model for uh, uh, entering the uh, electric car market, and it will it is definitely very d challenging for incumbents to uh, try to build or try to compete against Tesla with coming in at a later point with a more fract fract fractioned uh, or or diverse. Um, well, set of models that they they need to replace. Right. So 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 the way Tesla has built its business around a few a small number of models is completely different to how uh, General Motors, Ford, and Volkswagen have built their business around a wide range of different cars, wide range of different uh, um, setups for the different models. Absolutely makes total sense. Well, uh, we're we're probably coming up on a little bit of time. I'm so grateful for you to to come on the show. Welcome to the Not Conscious Family. Is there any are there any final thoughts? Anything you'd like to share before we call it a day? Well, I think we've we've covered most of the things that are uh, that I had in mind. I'm really grateful for uh, to you for inviting me on the show, and I I really think that you're. Uh, uh, the theme of knocked conscious is is great. It's uh, spot on because what we need to do here is to uh, knock people conscious. They need to become aware of the challenges of um, electromobility and what the the types of investment, the scale, the the uh, complexity of these changes. So um, I think we need to to knock a lot of people conscious here and try to find ways of getting through to decision makers in various parts of society. Absolutely. I couldn't say it any better. So thank you so much, Matt, for joining us. I'll put all your information and links on, uh, on this uh, site. Everyone, thank you again for joining Knocked Conscious. Welcome again, welcome again, Matt, to the family. And uh, hopefully we can have you again on uh, after you uh, write your next book or something like that. And we'll definitely talk another time, okay? Wonderful. Thank you very much, Mark. Thank you See so you. much. Have a great day. One, two, three, four. Good night, sweetheart. Well, it's time to go. Good night, sweetheart. Well, it's time to go. I hate to leave you, but I really must say, good night, sweetheart, good night.